Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and today's guest is Annalyn McCord. She is an American actress, activist, and model. She is most notably known for her roles on shows such as Nip Tuck and 90210. Aside from her acting career, she has been very outspoken about her mental health, healing, and disassociative identity disorder diagnosis. So please help me in welcoming Annalyn McCord to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Annalyn, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me, Doug. I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited to chat with you. I love your story. I love how open you are about your mental health. I love how open you are about all the struggles that you've overcome and the struggles that you continue to go through in real time. I think it's admirable. And I think we need more like real talk. And because I think that's what people relate to ultimately is having these real and raw conversations that people are opening up and, and, and sharing their truest selves. Because I think there's so many people out there that can relate to every single one of our stories in some way. And the, and the more open we are, I think the better off um, we're able to, to reach somebody and, and hopefully inspire them to make a decision to change as well. And I think where I want to start with you, I was, I was like, where do I want to start this conversation? One of the most fascinating things that I learned about you is that you had like these two drastically distinct memories of your childhood. Like you remembered how your childhood went down for like the first 31 years of your life. Then you had this moment where you were like, oh, shoot, so much went down that I had no idea, but now it's coming back to me. So what did that process look like? And then how did you begin to validate that that second memory of your childhood was actually real? Yeah, it was the probably the single most defining moment of my life with the exception of having the memories actually have occurred yeah you know, having had them occur so those moments would turn out to be quite defining but i didn't remember them for 31 years so it's kind of hard to know consciously that you're defined by something that you can't remember i lived for 31 years and it's funny cuz i've been locating I accidentally I've had organizers in my home and I've been finding old journals and it's really interesting to see this progression to be where I am at this point but now to be really kind of seeing how difficult my life was and I was reading something today that I wrote about that 31 year period and she was describing herself my 27 year old Anna Lynn version of me and she was saying, I say she because it feels like a very different time and a very different me. But that Anna Lynn was talking about how I would, you know, feel these, this need for this really rigid kind of structured rule following life. And then I was a complete rebel and a rule breaker and chaotic. And the swing from one to the other was kind of here nor there and I didn't really have a grasp on it and if you think about living like that it's it's a little bit terrifying so you're trying to hold on to anything to control anything and that was my my existence for 31 years was constantly constantly following this illusion of the belief that I could ever be in control and when I was 31 years old so three years ago I I had, I've been having panic attacks, post-traumatic stress disorder, dealing with PTSD for several years at that point. Panic attacks had become worse and worse. I started having blackout panic attacks. And at a certain point, I collapsed in the shower, crawled my way out of the shower and was like, okay, something's got to give. I need, I need help. And I, the, at that point, I Googled the closest EMDR, you know, therapist. Um, I was like, if it's not close by, I won't do it. So I need to find one that's in close proximity. I went, began treatment. I did two weeks of intake. I figured, you know, I fixed most of myself. So I'll give it six weeks and I'll be fine. <laughs> and cut to <laughs> my whole life got turned upside down. The third week, which was the first week of the actual EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing process, I had memories of childhood sexual abuse return and my entire life just was shattered into a million pieces because that story that I've lived for 31 years was no longer 
my real story. Wow. Wow. That's gosh, that had to have been frightening, fearful, anxious. It gives you giving you all these senses of anxiety, depression, everything all at once in that moment. And I can't imagine how you were feeling at that time. And I guess before we get into like where you went from there, like you mentioned having panic attacks and PTSD. Did you have any like memories of stuff that was causing some of this post-traumatic stress or were you just having symptoms of post-traumatic stress and you couldn't figure out why you were having it? Well, my, the sense that I had, because I also, I had conscious memories of not a very easy childhood. So I had chalked it all up to that, to a sexual assault that I experienced when I was a teenager out here in Los Angeles. I had kind of determined, as our brains love to do with the pieces of the story that we actually have, I had made up a story about why I was dealing with PTSD and why. And it, and when I say, I say made up very lightly for listeners, the brain does this. The brain protects the ability to survive. It does not care about quality of life. I will say that again. The brain protects the ability to survive. It doesn't care about quality of life. Quality of life means how wonderful your relationships are, how great everything's going, how easy it is to make a decision. If you're, you know, an indecisive person, that often comes from some kind of anxiety early on in childhood. All of these different things that were difficult for me to cope with, my brain had to create story after story after story to make it safe for me to move forward because my brain knew that Anna Lynn is a digger. Annalyn likes to dig, 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 and find all kinds of information and learn all kinds of things. And one of the ways that I was really, really challenging my own brain was that I was digging. I was digging into myself. And my brain was like, ah, shit, we got to do something here because this woman's going to find out the truth and she will not survive the truth. So my mind made up this the stories from the pieces of information that I consciously had. And at that point, I just thought, okay, there's a lot of not cool stuff that I saw witness was, was privy to was brought into as a child. And it's stuff that should never happen, especially, you know, I mean, it just shouldn't happen with children. So I was able to take that and assume that I was still dealing with that. And that was the PTSD. So I never dug deeper into that. I thought I already had the answer. And that's why the brain does that. That's why the brain tells those stories so that you don't dig deeper. When we went into treatment, I was utilizing frozen images, memories that had like kind of went "Ah!" and just stopped in my brain. And those frozen images were images that my mind would repeat over throughout my lifetime over and over and over again. And this is the key. This is the hook. This is the way in when you're looking for healing from these things. And I don't advise people to go down a healing journey. It is not for the faint of heart. Only do it if you know what you're getting yourself into. It is a lot of work. It is not fun. It is not easy. It is very difficult. I have so much, I hold so much respect for people who do this journey, not unlike yourself. It's very, very difficult. And it takes a long time to be okay. You open things that you kind of sometimes wish you hadn't opened. And in that moment, when that image, that first image that my doctor and I went into unfroze, I saw something I could never unsee. I saw my life as it actually had been lived out as a child. And it was horrifying. Gosh. um, Yeah. I mean, I think when you begin to take this healing journey and start it, Like there's a rude awakening, I think, that happens at the beginning for most people, and that it's super challenging. And you're used, and you're now having to face some of these traumatic experiences, some of these traumatic moments, conversations head on. And I think if you're not equipped with the right tools, the right medical professionals, the right support, it can take you down this rabbit hole of destruction on its own if you're not careful. So I'm glad that you, you brought that up. Like, I think healing is awesome. And I think everybody in their own timeline should work on their, 
they're on healing their past self if it's showing up in destructive ways now but make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and also having the the proper support in place and i think this is a good segue to get into the next part which was another big stepping stone for you which was learning that you had did or disassociative identity disorder but before this you were you were diagnosed as being bipolar and for the longest time that's what you thought you had and until the moment where they revealed your brain scans and they're like you know and this is not what you are this is what you are did you ever like question that like during during your diagnosis and the process like during your career as an as an actress or had you did you just assume that because they told you that's what it was that's what it was well actually i i was aware that I had the symptoms of bipolar prior to my diagnosis and I have family history of bipolar. So it was no shock to me that I was diagnosed as bipolar. And I absolutely, sheerly based on the symptoms that describe bipolar, I would say that my doctor wasn't wrong in diagnosing me as such. The issue I actually take is with the diagnostic statistics manual across the board because the American Psychiatrist Association and all of the hoopla that one must go through to, to be a psychiatrist, I know it's a lot of work and I'm, that book is a lot of effort that they put in, but they are wrong in their decision to omit trauma from the DSM. They are wrong. They are wrong. They wronged me. They wronged millions of people. And they are consistently and continually avoiding something that needs to change. So my issue is actually less with my psychiatrist. I think he actually diagnosed me correctly according to the book he's required to purchase and diagnose me from. Bipolar is a chemical imbalance that is incurable, as is stated in the DSM. What was shocking to me was that when I went through my trauma treatment, I no longer showed symptoms of, of bipolar, which oh, isn't possible because I had an incurable disease. <laughs> so how did I cure it? Because I didn't have bipolar to begin with, I would then go on to, as you said, have Dr. Amen scan my brain. But my doctor, my care doctor, who's a, who was my treatment specialist and is also an actual PhD, she she was totally fine with me going off of my medication because she knew that that we could watch it we would evaluate it i went off of my medication for bipolar in november of 2019 and then covid hit <laughs> and i should have had a bipolar episode for sure during covid stay at home trapped in your house the world's ending but not only did I not have a bipolar episode, I only continued to get better. So, so having had that happen, having the, the DID diagnosis be something that was so much more on point with what I was actually struggling with and what I had gone through, I felt validated finally. But I will say that one of the aspects of the DID journey that, it, that, is probably the most, um, I think the reason I'm most grateful for my diagnosis of DID is because it was along the journey of me being reintroduced to my little selves. And those parts of me had never been truly loved. And I got an opportunity to meet them and love them and be there for them and show up for them in a way that, that anyone who does want to embark on their healing journey, this is the only pathway with which to begin. You do not do anything until you research. That's what my doctor made very, very clear. And because I was going in and I was like, mama bear, like, let's go. I'm going to get my little Anna out of these situations. And I'd bring up a memory and I would pretend like it was a movie. And I'm like, Anna Lynn, Jane, Anna Lynn Bond. And I'm like, you know, going in to save little Anna. And, and I would pick my little self up out of these horrifying memories. And I would be like, I dare you to come at me, bro. I'm going to punch you out, you know. And I would take little me out of these memories. And I, it was just a wonderful part of the process of healing. But what happened in that journey was that I met myself. And I think that whether you're DID or not, 
we're not taught to meet ourselves. We're not taught to introduce ourselves to ourselves. It seems to go without saying, you know yourself, you are yourself. No, no. If you want to be in a relationship with someone, you have to get to know them. I didn't know myself. And I had to build a relationship with Anna Lynn. And I think that this is actually true for every human being. And we're just not taught this. There, there's so much there that you just said that I, and I can't agree with you more when it comes to developing a solid relationship with yourself before getting involved in a relationship with someone else. But I think it's important for us to kind of identify some terms here before we talk about like how you healed, how you unlearned a lot of these patterns and how you got to where you are today. Like DID, it often gets confused or in the same sentence as multiple personality disorder. And that can be very stigmatized. And I think some people can get an idea of what it is and it's really not. So in your experience and your understanding, like what is DID? Like what's going on in the brain? And and what are some of the things that are most misunderstood about it? Thank you for highlighting that. I obviously talk about this a lot, so I forget to spell out the details. And it is something that really does need to be spelled out because it has been misspelled out more than it has actually been spoken about, spoken about accurately. DID, formerly known as MPD, Dissociative Identity Disorder, formerly known as Multiple Personality Disorder, has been bastardized from its conception <laughs> or the conception of the idea of it. The idea that you could, that one person could have multiple personalities is, you know, very misleading as to what this actually is for the person experiencing it. And then my lovely industry that loves to dramatize anything takes what the idea of MPD was and then makes it something really, really not what it is. I know that I don't suddenly become British and need my tea at high noon is what I always say. I'm like, that's a role I'm playing in a different character. That's not what happens to you when you're dealing with DID. And with DID, you are disassociated, disassociated identities of your actual self. You are one whole person. You are one whole identity. Someone took a hammer to a mirror is the best way to describe it. Take a hammer to a mirror. Suddenly inside the frame are a hundred images of your own face. You're, you actually will see a hundred little pictures of you inside one image. You're still one person, but now there's a lot of faces looking back to you and they don't connect. They can't connect because they're compartmentalized by the cracks all around. And so that's how I describe the, the concept of DID. The experience of it is something altogether different as well. Being someone who has suffered DID, and thankfully I'm integrated now, so I, I can fluidly move from part to part because I've, I was able to glue those little mirror fragments back together with all the love that I infused into myself, and love is the only glue. <laughs> you got to bring love in. It is the only answer. So it was a lot of love and, and putting those pieces back together one by one and bringing in that care and releasing what doesn't serve me anymore. That's a big part of this. We want to, we want to know the story. We want the drama of it all. We want the details. We want, and it's like, what does it serve you? What does it serve you in your life moving forward? How does me digging all the way into all my traumas serve me? If I can release some of it, put those parts back together without ever having to see certain horrific things that happen. Why wouldn't I do that? Uh, now I know that I dug a little too deep and I saw some things that I wish I didn't see. And I know now I, I do first work on releasing. I release first. Is there anything that I can release, let go of, and then I go into what I can't get rid of. So, so experiencing that as a sufferer, I would be, Whatever identity was presenting at the time was always a result of feeling some form of threat. So I had these wonderful little protective anilins everywhere, and they were born out of the need to become something in order to cope with what was happening to me on the outside. If someone was talking about money, there was a part of me that would create itself and, and present itself as a nonchalant, I don't care, I'll pay for everybody, whatever, even when it wasn't really financially okay with me. I had a lot of terror around money. That was a split that I had from a very early point in my life where some really bad things happened to me because I 
because of money and a situation that I was in. So, so these protective mechanisms, unlike other people, and I describe it like this, who you are at the dive bar on a Friday night is not who you are with your mom on Sunday morning at church. <laughs> so if that's your thing, we all flow between these versions of ourselves with the little, not the COVID masks, the actual masks we wear. For someone who suffers DID, they can't get the mask off and they don't always choose to put the mask on. There, It is happening as an automatic, an autonomic response to the situation and the perceived threat by the brain. Mm. This is why, this is very important to understand because the person is experiencing themselves exactly as you are and they may not like it either. So when you call them crazy, they don't want to be crazy. They just don't know what to do about their automatic system that's doing a system override and putting them into the different faces of themselves. I'm so glad because I was going to ask you this, that you touched on like the difference between the normal spectrum of disassociation where we're able to flow through different people. Because sure, we're going to behave one way around. Like I would behave one way around my guy friends maybe than I would in front of my grandparents in church, right? And not, not in a destructive way, but I would probably have, I would watch what I would say more. For, you know, it's just, we all have that. I mean, and, come on. Anyone right? who tries to pretend like they don't, like <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> right now to my face. Right, right. And I guess the the best way that, that, I mean, I guess the way that people think of multiple personalities is they probably think of that movie, Me, Myself, and Irene with Jim Carrey, when he plays like the three different people and people have gotten this idea that that's what it is. And while that movie was funny and entertaining, it's not necessarily what it is. So I'm really glad that you, you, you touched on that. And I, and I really want you to share, there's this one story you were talking about it, it, on one of your interviews where, and it really highlights what you were just saying, how you couldn't switch from one mask to the other, where you played this role. It was either in a film or in a, in a series and you were, you had to go like meet somebody the next day mm-hmm. and you can, you couldn't get out of this one frame of mind from part of your personality. So if you could, if you could walk the audience through that, I think they would really, it would really shed light on exactly what you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. I originally laughed at actors who were like, I'm a method actor. I'm like, Oh my God, it's so dramatic. Whatever. You're just putting on like, come on. But everyone does have their own process. I had an experience where I had to go from a very disturbed, psychopathic, sociopathic little teenager in an independent film I did called excision I wrapped that film at 2 a.m. on a Tuesday and at Wednesday at noon, I was supposed to be Naomi Clark, blonde bombshell, funny girl from 90210. And the dichotomous <laughs> aspect of those two characters is so, I mean, talk about a spectrum, right? They were on either end. I could not find Naomi. I could not find the humor. I could not find the the way to say the line. I couldn't find the voice I used for this character I had been playing for three years. This was the fourth season. At this point, I had done about 80 episodes of this character. She was a living being inside of me. I could not find her. I was Pauline, this creepy little kid that I'd been for the last two months all day, every day. And, And I literally went up to my producing director and I was like Stuart I forgot how to act I don't know what to do like (laughs) this is a problem but what I thought at that time I what I took away from it was that oh oh my gosh I've shit on these method actors and I'm method I never knew I actually do fully disappear into a character what I came to as a result of my diagnosis of disassociative identity disorder is I believe and I I have no way of knowing whether this is true or not, but I believe that I actually split for every character that I've played as an actress. So split me. So split. So, so what I mean by that is, and it makes sense based on the algorithm. I told you, right. My splits. So the different identities, the different fragments of that mirror, all those different faces are splits. 
So I would split as a need to protect myself, but to, to become something in order to protect myself, right? I, by that algorithm, the terror I would feel on the first two days of filming on every project I've ever done would actually probably activate my brain to need a split. And in that process, it would have to split into what would cause me to not be feeling that terror. What would cause the terror to go away would be if I created a character that I was acting so well that I that I was getting response by the directors and producers. Good job. You're doing great. This is amazing. And I always would get that within the first probably couple of takes, but definitely the first day or two of filming, depending on how many scenes we did. So I feel just having had that experience with excision and then going back to 90210. I genuinely feel in my own journey that I split, at least in those particular cases. But I think in most of my projects, mm. I was splitting into new portions of myself in order to cope. Wow. And I, I can't even begin to fathom what that was like in real time when you were going through that, like the, the shame and the fear and everything that was going through your mind because you had played this role for a number of years and all of a sudden, you can't get yourself back into that role. You, you can't snap out of it. And you're wondering, because you, all you know is that you're bipolar. And you're like, how does bipolar prevent me from getting back into a role? Or you know that you had a little bit of trauma and, and, and certain things with your mental health, but it wasn't to the extent of what you well, know at now. Point, at that point, bipolar hadn't really been a conversation. I th That would be several years later. The and I wasn't I wasn't quite so self aware as to ever think that it was something <laughs> to do with me. I would probably blame somebody else. I was that self aware, you know. <laughs> like, ah, oh, it's your fault. Um, but I, it, it was, it was, you know. I, I think because and and in a way, I will say disassociation can be a really profound gift when you when you. I've been in a body that's been terrifying since I've come out of disassociation and now feel when things come up, it actually, I know what terror feels like in the body. I did not experience that at this level prior to my clearing of a lot of these traumas. And in a way that was a gift, but I think at the time I was, the panic that I would experience was always projected onto other people. And I had to make a lot of amends because my little shadow was a bitch. <laughs> um, but I, in those moments, the terror of not being, you know, able to do that and that shame would kind of, it would all compound into me acting out and doing something that would then get me called out as being crazy or, you know, this or that or whatever the labels were that were put onto me. And no one, no one thought to ask, oh, I wonder what happened to this poor girl, you know? And I think that that's just not the world that, that we were in. I think we're starting to be in the world where people are like, oh, I wonder what happened to them that they're like this because we're having these conversations, not unlike the one you and I are sharing in right now. But especially not at this time. This was, you know, this was almost 10 years ago. And it, I, this was 10 years ago. There was, there was just, oh, she's a crazy actress. Anyway, moving on. Well, well, now people are so open about their mental health because it's more accepted. And, it, and, and I think people are beginning to come around and saying that the, somebody's mental health doesn't necessarily define them. Whereas if you had admitted you had mental health issues 10, 15 years ago, you would have been identified as, as crazy, like you said, or, or something else. And, and people just didn't talk about this stuff. And um, I will say, I will say, because I was looking, unfortunately, at some of the flack that the um, Olympic medalist was receiving. We're still a long way from where we need to be, but we've made remarkable progress in the last decade. And I would, and I clearly do feel much more comfortable speaking about things that I've been diagnosed with now than I ever would have probably felt back then. For sure. For sure. So let's talk about the healing process because I, I'm sure that this, while it's been very freeing, I'm sure it was very challenging, especially because you described the idea as being this broken mirror with a bunch of different pieces and having to put those pieces back together in a way that was encouraging and optimistic and and positive given all the stuff that you've now seen you've went through. And um, there's a lot of people that would run from that. They would be like, I don't want to accept this as part of who I am. 
there's no point. I don't want to touch that. It's too traumatic or I'm never going to have a healthy relationship anyway. So what's the point? So like, how did you begin to pick these pieces up and repair that mirror once you got your diagnosis and once you started to uh, come to terms with what happened in your past? Absolutely. Well, just to speak to that point for one second, I'll say if you do feel the need to avoid it and not acknowledge that that's a part of what your journey is. It's kind of like drinking poison and trying to pretend like you're not getting sick. And when you do get sick, blaming everything else in the environment or people or whatever, and not acknowledging that every day you wake up and you go in the refrigerator and you drink a bottle of arsenic, (laughs) which I think would probably kill you. But in little doses, you're making yourself sick by, by not acknowledging it because any trauma in the body, which is survival instinct unrealized, survival instinct unrealized in the body is exacerbated by time. Mm. So whatever it is that you're dealing with, that you're struggling with, and a lot of times mental health issues or the diagnoses that you'll receive originate or could have been dormant if you had loving, wonderful life growing up and everything was perfect and peachy when you were a child and it wasn't. So something that was dormant became realized or you had a trauma that created itself in your cells as a result of what was happening to you on the outside. So drink the poison, but just know that you will stay sick for as long as you drink poison. And if you stop drinking the poison at some point and start to detox, it's shitty. Detox sucks. But then you start to be, thankfully, what what I'm starting to experience now. And and it is this, this journey of healing that I'm on right now is, I literally wrote in my journal today, I was like, today... I am just experiencing life. Life is unfolding. I'm, I did my laundry. I made my breakfast. Like my cat is here. I, I, nothing profound and crazy and wild has happened, but I am at peace in my body. Nothing is yelling at me in my mind. Nothing's abusing me. Nothing's screaming at me. Nothing's telling me to go do something. I was the queen of do, 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 must do. I had to do something at all times. And then I I tried to do my healing. And then I tried to do my spiritual enlightenment. And I was like, stop doing. Stop doing because you're not being anything. You're just doing. And I love there's this, someone who says we're not called human doings. We're called human beings for a reason. It's about being able to be. One of my vices was doing stuff. And I got a lot of props for it because it was like, look at what you've accomplished at such a young age. Oh, my God. You're such a success. And I was like, and I'm miserable. Thank you. The end. <laughs> but now I a part of my healing journey is is looking at how each moment of my life uh, that I raced towards and rushed through, I'm grateful that I'm where I am and I I have no regrets, but I missed a lot. (laughs) I missed a lot of moments. And now what it matters to me is how does my body feel? You know what? We don't stop and ask ourselves, how's your chest feel right now? How does it feel in your chest? How does it feel in your heart? How does it feel in your stomach? How does your, 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 gut feel right now when we do when we make decisions it's one of the first things I do is I go in and I ask does this decision feel okay in my body Mm. that's a part of healing we never as as sufferers and I'm sure you've experienced this most of us become people pleasers the last person we're thinking about what they think is ourselves we're always thinking about everybody else and what they're thinking what's panicking Ah, And I ask me how I feel, what's going on with me? How do I feel in a situation with a person? Do I want to be in this? Do I want to walk out? And I honor myself. Like I have a lot of people who, who I work with, you know, kind of in a counseling dynamic where I just, you know, I'm being the support system, but it ends up being kind of a counseling situation. And in the last two months, I've been dealing with a physiological thing. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm taking care of me right now. I don't have any space or time for you. Oh my gosh, well, I'm just really going through something really hard right now. Yes, I understand that. 
as am I. <laughs> and I don't have an Annalyn to call. I am doing this with the only Annalyn that I know, which is myself. So I thank you that you trust me to, to put my, your story into my hands and rely on me. But in this moment, you cannot. Mm. I will let you down. I don't have anything to give you. And I honor that part of me. And I don't think it's rude. I think it's beautiful. And anyone who's like that with me, I just affirm back to them. This is how we heal our world. Because when this world, when the world of the body feels okay, we can handle anything out in the world outside. But when this world, when the world of the body does not feel okay, everything is collapsing around us, whether it is or not. It's an imagined causality and it is real to us. So for me, the greatest gift I can give anyone who's in proximity to me is that I heal myself and that I take care of myself when I have moments where I'm not feeling. So the, the inner child work, top of the list. You don't do that work, you will not heal ever. It will not happen. I'm very sorry to tell you, if you think you can skip around it, you cannot. If you don't want to go love on your inner child, you will never heal the end. If you, if you don't agree with me, just try. <laughs> You'll see. It'll come up. If you do inner child work, sometimes you don't ever have to do anything else. You can start to live and be and exist in your human self and honor that space. And you might not have to do anything else because that might be the one thing you needed. But all of us, according to our psychotherapists, we have a wounded child. We have the parent and we have the adult. If, we, if we're not DID, but we at least have those three splits, right? That's any, doc, any therapist will tell you that. So honoring the, the parts of you that live within you is what I learned from DID. What are those parts? Do you know them? Can you label them? Can you find them? Will you sit with seven-year-old Doug and say, Hey, buddy, I'm so sorry for all of your pain. I'm so sorry for all the moments you felt unseen and unheard. I'm here now and you will get hurt again, but I am never going to leave you alone. You will never be unseen. You will never be unheard again because I'm here. Can you show up for yourself like that? That's what this journey has become. I say good morning every day to Anna Lynn. <laughs> if I was in the house with someone else, I would say good morning to them. How did they sleep? I, I check in with myself just like that now. So inner child work, we all know is, is super important no matter what you're healing from. So I'm so glad that you brought that up. Boundaries, another staple for healing because we're often, like you said, people pleasers and we want to take care of others before we take care of ourselves. And then we end up in this constant self-betrayal toxic cycle that can just play out in other areas of our lives. And then you talked about the role that that EMDR played. Like what else? Like is there anything that's different about healing from DID and, and doing things on a daily basis so that it doesn't get triggered, it doesn't get exacerbated that's any different than say any other mental health issues like anxiety, depression and that sort of thing? Well, first, because uh, I do appreciate you brought up boundaries. I started boundary work before I did inner child work. Got it. That's a no-no. That was a no-no. I actually, what happened because I didn't do inner child work first, I swung the pendulum too far. Mm. And I was harsh and I was intense and I was rigid and I was cold with my boundaries. And people who had been used to me just having an open yard suddenly were faced with a fortress and a medieval bridge that was drawn and crocodiles in the moat and a dragon with fire. And it was like, ah, what just happened? And they didn't understand. And in my relationships, it, it was difficult to navigate when I had had just forced those boundaries. Again, you have every right to do it. It's your life, Charlie Brown. But I recommend honoring the child part because the child will do what feels right, what feels safe. When you, when you do the inner child work, you will go off of feeling because the child did not have the analytical brain. An analytical brain can implement boundaries, but it won't feel good. It will feel like I'm forcing something. It will feel like I have to in, enforce something, that I'm being rigid or chaotic rigid cha rigid or chaotic if you're on if you're on either end of a spectrum you know there's something amiss that's what i've learned from this so taking that into the did conversation and how what to do 
everything will fall in place if you go back in time and heal the child. The pieces began in childhood and they will end when you return to your childhood. So, so what does that look like on a day-to-day basis? It looks like treating the body like baby and the mind like the adult, which is actually what they are. So when our brain started to develop the analytical mind, by age 12, 13, we're going through puberty. We have now stepped into beta brain waves, right? So delta from zero to two years old, from two to six years old, we're in theta brain waves. From six to around 12, 13, we're in alpha brain waves. Those brain waves are all very wonderful. Delta is deep sleep. Theta is meditation. Alpha is creativity. When you get into beta and you start moving up into high beta, beta is a necessary brain wave. We need that. But we live in high beta most of the time, and that causes our body to be in constant toxic stress. Mm. So that first period, 0 to 12 years old, where most of your shit went down and most of the trauma probably happened, you were in the better states of mind. So dropping into those states as an adult might be scary at first because they were when the things happened. But they're on, the only place that will heal it. So what I taught myself to do is I do playful things. I color, I swing on the swing at the park. I do child things, activating the body as baby, remembering the body as baby. And when the body gets stressed out, when I go through stress, I don't try to snap myself out of a thought. Think positive. Toxic positivity is, we could have a whole podcast episode about how much I do not like that. Do not try to come at me, bro, with toxic positivity bullshit. We are shadows and we are light. We are both. If you don't have both, you have neither. You don't exist. The shadow part of us, the part of us that has the baby part of us, the the body part of us, all of those aspects of ourselves have to be acknowledged and realized. What I mean by that, I'm sorry, my cat has just arrived to say hello. Hi, Chloe. What I mean by that is when I go through stress, any stressful moment, if I can tell my mind, oh, that I don't need that thought, let it go. But the body's still feeling stress. I then say, oh, this is really yucky. Yeah, this is not fun. This is, this is happening. It's going to go away. It will calm down. But right now it's really awful. I see. I see how gross this feels. Yucky, yucky, icky, icky. And I talk to my body as if it is a child. It sounds crazy. I don't give a shit. Crazy healing. If I can heal from being crazy, I will do it. They call me crazy anyway. So steps like this, the where you validate every aspect of yourself. The shadow work, talk about not being able to heal. Inner child work and shadow work are the only two, like are the only two things I care about anymore. I I every bad thing that I've ever done, I go back in my mind and say, you did a good job. You did a really good job. I know that you didn't have the tools at the time to do what we could have done a little bit better. You know, you didn't have to be a dick, but you didn't know that because you only had these tools and people had been dicks to you. And so you were that to them. Now mom is going to take it from here, (laughs) but I don't reject the parts of myself that have caused harm to others. I acknowledge them. I dance with them and I take it over and I move on from that. This part of society, we are in a nightmare of a, of a situation because of our shame culture that we're in right now. They're calling it cancel culture, I've heard. It's called shame culture, sweethearts. It's been in existence for a very long time and it has served absolutely zero humans. It does nothing for anyone at all. It is horrible. I can't stand it. Shame is calibrated by Dr. David Hawkins, who's a kinesiologist who studied the calibrate, um, studied the body and in kinesiology for 30 years, he measured the, the calibration of human emotions for 30 years. He documented this. Shame calibrates at 20, which is a step below death. So everybody who's all about cancel culture and shaming everybody and all the stuff that we're all into at the moment, because that's the new phase, you're walking dead people or you're trying to inspire walking death. I don't support it. I've lived in it for 30 years. What I like is accountability. I talk about this on the Call Her Daddy podcast. Accountability culture 
is something I can get down with. Also, what are we, what are we looking for in any form of healing and whether it's our world, the country, our relationship with ourselves, the, our, our trauma, we have to ask ourselves, what is the objective here? What are you trying to do? If I shame myself all throughout my healing journey, what am I trying to achieve? Because I ain't going to achieve it <laughs> unless it was to you know, push myself off the ledge. I might right. do that. And I think personal accountability is everything. And I love how in different parts of, of your story, you've always, it seems as of late, held yourself accountable. Like you've acknowledged a lot of the unfortunate trauma that's happened in your life and the mental health issues that have come from that. But you've also been the first when sharing your story to say like, like, these are some of my pitfalls. This is where I messed up. This is where I could have done different. This is where I've gotten better. So what have been, because I want to talk about I, the shame in a minute, but while we're on this topic of accountability in yourself, like what were some of the toxic patterns that you had to unlearn and, and how have you healed them to now have a, to now have a healthy relationship with yourself and then moving forward in other relationships? Thank you for that question. Yes. Some of the things that I've had to take accountability for were a lot. Most of them were centered around me and relationships and, and Dr. Dan Siegel, who is a doctor that I absolutely love, an MD and neuroscientist, he says all of our problems and all of their solutions start and end in interpersonal relationships. And that's the truth. You, you won't get a problem unless you have an interpersonal relationship and you won't fix it unless you're in another one. So I realized that I was a cheater with my energy. I would withdraw love to punish a partner for actions that felt hurtful to me. I felt completely validated and justified in my actions because what they did was horrible by all of society's accounts. <laughs> of course, that's when I rely on society. I'm a rebel against society right up until I want what they have to say. And then I'm all like, oh, oh, wait, you know what? Society makes you an asshole. So I get to treat you badly too. So I had to take accountability for that. And, and this, though this seems like not a big deal, imagine loving someone and every time you show a flaw, which you will do because you are flawed, we all are, that person doesn't just rip the carpet out from underneath you. They knock you straight off the fucking balcony, <laughs> but they're sitting there all sweet and smiling and and you didn't actually fall off of a balcony. You just fell off of a balcony inside of yourself. Energetically, that's what I was doing to people. I was pushing them off of an emotional balcony because I couldn't cope with how hurtful the situations were because they were touching wounds that were incredibly, excruciatingly painful for me. As a result of that, I had very little experience with intimacy in my relationships. I liked relationships with partners who lived in other countries or who traveled a lot. I didn't want to ever be too close and I wouldn't allow anyone to get too close to me. That was one of the things that was a really big demon for me to face. I, I, I really had a hard time bringing kindness to myself. Having done that, I wanted to shame myself for that. And I did not. I said, you know what? Of course you did this beautiful little girl. Of course you did. And we can own that with these people if it makes sense to make amends. But right now, of course you did that. So I brought kindness to that space and suddenly, voila, it was able to just go away because once it was realized and validated and it wasn't yelled at and shamed and canceled, I was able to let it go. Another aspect was I'd actually physically cheated on people. I had to bring kindness to that. How do you bring kindness to yourself when you caused harm, when you cheated, when you lied, when you've done all these things? Those I was deceptive. I was manipulative. I would, you know, play on things that I knew about you and use those against you. And those were things that I hated being done to me. And I would do them to other people. And I had to look at myself and I had to say, of course you did those things, beautiful girl. Of course you did. And we're not going to do them anymore, but I'm going to honor the fact that you probably didn't know 
you could do anything better. You probably didn't know how. And I didn't. I knew that I was supposed to do better. I knew they were bad when I was doing them, but I didn't know how to do anything differently. I was in panic mode at all times. So I bring both the accountability, ownership, talking to you freely about it, but also I'm not going to sit here and say I'm a terrible person. I'm not. I'm a human being who had terrible things happen to her and she did terrible things, but but I will always give every human the room to move beyond that because I believe in redemption and cancel culture does not. So, right. so the shame for me, everything about my life is how can I redeem this moment? How can I, and redemption comes with the truth. That's why I'm so open and transparent. Mm. Redemption comes with the truth. I love that. There's so much there. And I think it's a really good segue because I wanted to go back into the shame. But the reason I wanted to go back is because I wanted to show like how open you are with some of your pitfalls. Because it's it can be easy, I think, at times in the in the near term to blame what, what's happened in your past, to blame mental health for the actions we take. And I think there's obviously some room for that, right? Especially if you're somebody who hasn't done or hasn't taken the time to maybe heal and process a lot of those emotions, right? But I really value how vulnerable you are in sharing, this, despite like all the stuff you've gone through, how you've still been so focused on unlearning these patterns that have caused chaos in your relationships. And you talked about like owning your shame as the ultimate like tool and form of redemption, right? Owning your past, because now you're looking at your past as something that happened to you and you're moving it to something that's happened for you. Now you're using your past as a mechanism to not, not only help heal yourself, but to help heal other people. Now you're using your past as something that isn't, is no longer draining you, but it's fueling you. And there's power in that. There's so much power in that. And there's a lot of people that are listening to this. Maybe they're watching it on YouTube. Maybe they might you know, listen to it if they're fans of yours, whatever the case may be. There's something inside of them that they're ashamed of, something in their past, something in a relationship, something that they did yesterday. So what has been some of your best practices for yourself and advice you might give to somebody that's close to you in order to own your past, own the shame, and not let it bring you down anymore. Well, first of all, thank you for all of that and and for this question. And it, it is something that is so, so a part of the journey that I have lived, am living, but also want to live moving forward, which is to continue this conversation. <sighs> Best practices for me, when I sat down with my doctor in the EMDR session, I said, I do not believe in shame. <laughs> to me, I think of shame like Santa Claus. It just has a different feeling. <laughs> Santa Claus is very real right up until he isn't. For me, shame was very real right up until it wasn't because I decided that I didn't like it. And the beautiful thing about living inside a body that is controlled by a very powerful mind, <laughs> which all of our minds are. They, we don't even know it sometimes how powerful our minds are. If you start cutting the cords with your belief in shame, shame starts to dissipate in your existence. That doesn't mean that the world around you doesn't piss you off because they're shaming people nonstop. That will continue, I'm sorry to say, unfortunately, no matter how much I squabble about it. But my panic in my body and the yuckiness in my stomach and the icky anxiety tightness in my shoulders and my chest from that shame those feelings don't exist anymore because i ended my relationship with shame i said we're we're getting a divorce <laughs> you and i don't see eye to eye it is irrevocably absolutely unrepairable. We cannot work this out. We're done. And, and I, I bring a lot of humor into my journey because I got a lot of this shit, you know, I'm sorry. Like I can't just be serious all the time. So I bring a lot of humor in and shame does not appreciate humor. Shame wants you to be very serious. Shame wants you to take everything seriously. But one of the most amazing things that I learned because I was painfully private to the extent that I had my sisters sign NDAs to live with me, my own sisters, my own blood 
my DNA. I made them sign non-disclosure agreements to live in my house. I was terrified that anyone would know anything about me, especially <laughs> not all the shit that I tell everyone all the time now <laughs> on podcasts and interviews and all the things. So I went from that to who I am today because I learned something really, really remarkable. If someone calls you a bitch and you're hiding the fact that you're a bitch, it's really horrible to hear it. It hurts. It makes your stomach feel yucky. Everything feels icky. You start defending yourself. You start offensively going after them. But if you say, yeah, you know what? I can be a bitch. You take the wind out of their sails so fast. It's hysterical. You're just, I would, I, I got addicted to people's faces falling because I would be like, yeah, I'll take your insult. No problem. It is the most hysterical thing. This is how I started it. This was my journey against shame. My fight against shame was actually a surrender to shame. I was like, go ahead. Shame me with all you've got. Yeah. I've been a liar. Yeah, totally. Oh yeah. Cheater. Yeah. <laughs> You know, a lot of people, um, you know, like I, I started to bring in truth, which allows for redemption, as we previously discussed. But in the process of it, by bringing the humor, it helped. But I took the wind out of the sails of what it was coming to do. It was there to attack me. And I didn't allow the attack. I hugged it instead. I grabbed my arm around swords and axes and got a few cuts and scratches along the way. But there's something really crazy. If someone's coming at you with a sword and an axe and you hug them, they're going to have a hard time chopping off your head. <laughs> it's just a little confusing. It disorients them. So I started to disorient shame. And, and now my relationship with shame is that, it, you know, we're exes. You said that so beautifully. And I often equate this to like this idea of a short-term hard truth and a long-term lie. There's a lot of people that, that love this long-term lie and they create this like almost like, I guess, I don't know if the right word is cognitive dissonance between the person they actually are and the person they pretend to be. And it ends oh, yeah. up creating. Cognitive dissonance is the phrase I use right. for our whole world. <laughs> right. And it ends up creating this unhealthy relationship with ourselves because deep down we know that we're having to keep up with this lie and fabricate the story of who we are to everybody around us. But inside, we know the truth. And maybe the truth isn't something that's quote unquote destructive, but we're, we fear that somebody that we tell it to is going to use it to destruct us. And the reason I com it's like, and the reason I compare it with the, the hard truth and the long term lie is like, imagine this, like, the short-term hard truth is like this. It's like if you have a Band-Aid on a wound and you rip the freaking Band-Aid off and there's the wound for everyone to see. Could be something you did three years ago. It could be incarceration. It could be something that happened in your childhood. It could be a relationship, whatever it is. Now it's out there and it's in the open and you can have those conversations with those people. And the people who judge you for that, cool, they can leave right now because they're not meant to be in your life in the future anyway. But with the long-term lie, what happens with that Band-Aid is you pull the Band-Aid off like a little bit. And what happens when you do? The, the, the wound's still kind of there. It burns a little bit. It hurts a little bit. And now you're continuing to have to cover up that wound because you're afraid of what people are going to say when you share that wound. And that wound continues to stay with you now for a good bit of your life until you rip the Band-Aid off and let it heal naturally. And the reason I bring this up is because when we talk about shame and owning your story, I think it's so important to put it all out there and let people know like what you've been through and own your past and know that it's made you who you are today. Now, I think you need to go through some emotional processing before you do that. Like I don't, in my experience, like I know I've processed something on social media and I'm like, I probably shouldn't have done that. Right. Where I'm like, I probably should have taken some time to go through that, go through that situation first and let the emotion settle. And I think we've all, we're all guilty of this at times, but you see where I'm getting at. So I'm really glad that you, you brought that up because it's, it's super important. I think for people to be able to understand that that's the ultimate hack in life. One of the ultimate hacks is being so truly confident, so un un unapologetic and so comfortable with every single part of you. And even though you might not be proud of every single part of you, because maybe it was things you look back and you're like, man, like 
I can't believe I cheated on that person or I can't believe I robbed that person or I can't believe this or that. Like, you know that it made you who you are today and there's been some wisdom and growth that's come from that. Absolutely. I mean, I think, and again, thinking back to this 20-year-old, 22-year-old version of myself who wanted NDAs signed (laughs) from her sister's the idea that I would go on to be this extremely transparent human who says things that my sisters call me and they're like, could you please not? Like, this is too much. I'm getting texts from all my friends and they're praying for you because they're like, we don't know what else to do at this (laughs) point. This is like, they've run out of thoughts of how they can help. So I've, I've been now on both ends of the spectrum, but My mother's grandmother, so my great grandmother would always say, if you never lie, you never have to remember what you said. And I love what you said about this long term lie versus the short term, you know, that that painful short term truth, this. This story that you have to uphold. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. And it. It never actually lasts. The, the truth always comes out. I had a friend who was, you know, like, well, you know, I'm just trying to like handle this so that my kids never find out. And then like, maybe I'll die early and they'll just think of me as, I'm like, you, like how many people have we found stuff out about postmortem? You know, like, like there, there's this freedom and I fight for freedom. I fight for human, tra- you know, I fight human trafficking and fight modern day slavery for physical freedom for, for survivors of human trafficking, victims of human trafficking. I am like, I'm always talking in these themes of slavery and, and being enslaved and what that's like on a personal level. And on a personal level, it looks like not being able to tell who you truly are, what you've done in your life and why and you why you express and process the way that you do anytime you have to you know cover that up and hide from it it's it you're living in your own a prison of your own creation and and for me i think i don't i don't recommend telling the truth across the board at first just tell one truth stop telling one lie Stop telling one little lie. I used to lie about the dumbest stuff. I would lie for no reason. Like everything that came out of my mouth was a lie. But like, I would just think later, like, God, that was such a dumb lie. Like that didn't, that lie didn't even have any reason to be said. Like, what was I saying that for? And I think that in giving yourself the space in the room to just tell one truth, it's just one. Today, just tell one truth that you would otherwise have probably placated or lied or or made to be slightly more glistening and shiny than it actually is. And and that pathway to truth is the pathway to redemption, is the pathway to healing, is the pathway back to yourself, is the pathway home, is the pathway to your inner child, and it's all circle. And it all brings you to that space within yourself where no matter what's happening around you, this world, the world of the body feels better and the world outside can be more easily tackled and handled and and coped with as a result. And so there's so many people that are looking for the next best way, next best hack to build self-esteem, to build their self-confidence. And one of the easiest ways to do it is to tell the truth because What happens when you lie? Like when you lie, like you always, it feels good in the moment because you're like, oh, like I'm pulling the wool over that person's eyes or I'm validating my own BS or I'm protecting my ego. But then afterwards, trying to not be found out. I feel like a fraud and I have to not be found out. But then afterwards, you're like, you feel like crap about yourself. And then that becomes a pattern. And then you slowly start digging yourself a, a bigger hole, a bigger hole, a bigger hole. And then the original lie that you're now having to create in a, as a result of the first lie you told like three months ago is so gigantic. You're like, how did this all come about? Well, it was just, you started to stack all these little lies on top of each other. And now you're making up this insane story. I mean, I know this from my addiction days, what I would lie about and, and how I would manipulate people to get money or get my, with my family to like, and the stories I would make up in my head. And I would actually, for a minute, believe it. I would convince myself to believe it in that moment until I told the lie. And then once I told the lie, I felt like crap. 
And I was like, man, I can't believe that I'm still doing this stuff. So well, see, I just disassociated and fill anything. So yeah. <laughs> I really had to come back. <laughs> <laughs> I really had to come back. And it, and I remember the first time I told the truth about something that was really scary to tell. And, and I do want to give room for you. If you were attempting to make that truth statement in your life where you want to lie less and, and be a little more honest with yourself with others it's not easy and I pro hats off to you if you tell one truth when you've told all lies you're doing great good job celebrate the small wins but I remember that feeling of like oh 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 I told the truth oh that and I wasn't punished I wasn't punished for the truth I was always terrified of being punished so this this like the lies were materialized out of those survival mechanism and I honored that need to survive. So I'm not punishing myself for the lies I've told. I'm acknowledging them, acknowledging that, you know, there's better ways, Anna. And, and I'm stepping into that truth, one truth at a time. And that's what we, you know, I have a, I have a, I think, what is he? 17 month old. So I have a 17 month old nephew and when he started walking a few months ago, we clap. We clap for his steps. Every step he takes, we clap and we yahoo and yay, you're so it's so great, shoot a bug. And he he's getting this praise to affirm that he's doing something good and he should continue in that vein. We need to do that for ourselves. Yay, you told the truth. Woohoo! Yes, uh-huh. Let's do more of that. Let that striatum, that reward center in the brain, light up like a Christmas tree when you do something good. Don't focus on the 90 lies you told. Focus on that one truth that you told because that is what's going to tell the brain to do it again. And Shut out every other person who tells you anything else because I'm right. Um, no. <laughs> because, because what matters is your life. Nothing else matters. Your life matters. And when your life matters, the lives of the people around you will start to be, they will receive the benefits as a result of you deciding that your life matters. And that means telling the truth when you can. Getting honest with yourself first and foremost. Stepping into that time capsule, travel back to 1992 and say hello to that little you and say, I'm here for you. I'm going to show up for you. and I'm going to make you trust me. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Setting those boundaries that stop people from encroachment. Creating boundaries for yourself if you are an encroacher. These are all aspects of, of, of coming back home to yourself and remembering to play. We have to play. Children play. They don't think about it. They don't feel guilty for it. They enjoy it. They love it. And they go on to the next thing. Playing is something that adults do not do or they feel bad for doing. That is done. Playing is where it's at. This is the key to living life. Being able to be in a state of play puts you into a creative space, puts you into a meditative space, and suddenly we're back at that zero to 12 place where we're being in ourselves. We are a human being, and those are all ways to heal. Breath work, sound baths, meditation, coloring, drawing, painting, swing sets, jumping into the ocean, whatever it is, those are not only are they the important aspects of healing, but they should be celebrated because when you choose to do that as an adult, you are going against hundreds of years of people saying you should work harder because no, you should not. The end, I'm done. <laughs> the importance of, of small wins cannot be emphasized enough, especially, especially when you're in a time of transition, when you're in a time of darkness, when you feel that things are so much against you and it, you can, you don't see any win. So, and I've changed my stance on this because I was always the guy that was like, just get out and do it. Just go out and run a mile, go out and do those pushups because that's in a way that mentality worked for me for a, a lot of my life in my recovery from addiction was just like, I just did it. Like I didn't think about it, it just became second nature. But now, like, as I look back and like, all right, like, what would I have needed in that moment? And I looked at, I actually started to take small steps in my fitness to get to a place where it became a routine. So now I tell people like, if you haven't exercised in 20 years, like don't make the goal to go to a gym, the gym for an hour, make the goal to get outside for a five minute walk. 
right? Wait, I literally just did this yesterday. <laughs> so I hadn't exercised in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the gym for an hour and five minutes. But I was doing it one step at a time. I didn't plan to be there for an hour, though, like the elliptical thing said an hour. Yeah. And, I was like, hmm. and then I was like getting competitive with myself. And I was like, well... I'm going to have to stick around for a little bit longer. I'll just do half an hour. And then I like, I kept upping the increment. I ended up doing like the whole thing, but it's funny you say that because, because absolutely it's the same mentality with the telling one truth or just five minutes of a walk. Anything that again, being kind to yourself, that's it. That's all there is. I mean, every pathway that leads you to peace is a pathway that will get you there. And, and they all look different, but they end up in the same spot and that's all that matters. Right. No. And and you're, you're, it's spot on because it's so important to, to have that mindset to know that don't be comparing your, and it sounds, this sounds cliche now. Don't don't compare your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 30. But what I see so much is the people that focus on their, the chapter 30 of somebody else, they never get started with their chapter one. They never get, they never get to chapter two or chapter three because they're so focused on the chapter 30 of the people they're following on social media. They're so focused on the chapter 20 of their parents. They're so focused on the chapter 19 of their friends. And they forget that in order for every single one of those people to get to that chapter in their life, they had to start with chapter one at some point, right? And you talked about inner child, and I want to share something really quick, and then we'll kind of close the our conversation a little bit. But one of the things I did was I bought like a Lego set. And I haven't, Yay! I haven't, I haven't built a Lego set. This is last year. I haven't built a Lego set. I mean, probably since I was, I don't know, a kid, like a young, young kid. And it was so hard for, I was like, I can build this Lego set. Like yeah. it's super easy. Like it's made for, you know, kids. Yeah. And I realized how impatient I was with it. I was like trying to get it all done at once. Right. I'm like super right. like type a, like logical guy. I'm like, I can get this done just all at once. And, but after I got done, I still have it like it's like sitting over there like behind me. I was like, wow, this looks really cool. It was actually like this the city of Las Vegas because it was it was I had never been to Vegas. I never had a reason to go and with my history with addiction, I was like, I don't know if that would be the best spot for me to go, but <laughs> uh, but I ended up going out there recently for a podcast interview and and it was funny. I I came and I looked came home and I remembered I still had this Lego set of Las Vegas that was built. And I was like looking at it, kind of comparing it to the skyline of Vegas when I went in real time to say like, is this really like how it is? And so that was really helpful for me in that moment. And I think the other thing that's helpful for people when they want to heal is self-awareness. And there's a story I've told uh, several times where life was really good for me, where I was making good money. I was healthy. I had good, you know, friends. I was, you know, writing books and and that sort of thing, but I was still creating my own chaos in my life. And I had no idea why I was doing it. Like, I was like, why am I stressed out? Why am I anxious? Like, what do I have to be? And it was almost, I was like questioning myself, like, why am I anxious? And I remember sitting in my therapist's office because I went to therapy for a while. And she said, what was childhood like? And what I said was, and it wasn't like the events that happened. She said, what was the dynamic of your household? Like, and I was like, it was pretty chaotic. And she was like, so you're subconsciously going back to chaos and that's bringing you back to homeostasis. That's what, that's what's normal for your body. And that was such a game changer for me because I was like, this all makes sense. Like once I could figure out like why something makes sense, like I'm like, all right, cool. Like I can figure out a way to like navigate it. And the reason I bring this up is there's a lot of people that don't have that awareness yet. And they're they're walking through life and they're having unhealthy relationship after unhealthy relationship. They're constantly stressed. They're constantly anxious. They're talking down to themselves in a way that's not conducive to the person they want to be. And a lot of it, I think, just comes from not even being aware of what's going on. It's just become their new sense of normalcy. So you seem very self-aware now, especially with all the work you've done on yourself. What have been some of your best practices for you to develop self-awareness and maintain it so that you can continue to to do the work on yourself? Yeah, I will try not to get long-winded. I know that I've had you here for a long 
on time. <laughs> I tend to go off on tangents in case you haven't noticed. I'll try to do this succinctly, but some of the best practices for me for self-awareness started with an inward journey as a result of a moment where I had a situation happen to me and everyone was like, it was a really bad situation. And they were like, everyone kept saying, this is not your fault. This is not your fault. This is not your fault. And I didn't like that. I didn't like that. It wasn't my fault because that meant that I couldn't control it in the future. And I started to ask myself in what, in what way have I invited this in? And by invited this in, I mean, have I ever done this or been like this to someone else? And it was a betrayal moment. And all of a sudden, it, even though in this particular dynamic, I had been awesome, I realized I have betrayed people in the past and I'm feeling it when it matters the most to me, this betrayal moment. And that turned my focus inward to look at myself. And that was the beginning. I, I was around, I think it was around my 25th birthday. And I start, and now to this day, I ask myself with every situation, if I get frustrated with someone or they're annoying me, I'm like, what in me is being reflected back from this person? What am I, what am I not seeing about myself that's activating me? Because if you think about it, like certain things will bother you and other things don't. If someone calls me a whale, I might laugh because there's no world where anybody looks at me and thinks that I look like a whale. I don't look like a whale. But if you tell me I'm too skinny, I have a wound there. I have worried that I was too thin sometimes. I've tried to keep weight on and I've had a difficult time doing that due to my anxiety. I, eating is very difficult when I used to have severe anxiety. And so I think about that now when something activates me. Why? So I ask why with everything. You will never get in trouble if you are the but why kid, except when you're a kid and parents don't appreciate that you want to understand the world. I was the but why kid. I returned to being the but why kid. And that's what I do with everything. And it always unravels it for me. Why is this happening? What is this moment about? What is it here to teach me? Why, 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 why? Love it. Such a great answer to, to really start to go within and ask yourself, certain questions about the situation and about how you're feeling in that moment to help clarify like why you're feeling a certain way. Like what is it about the situation? What is it about maybe your past or whatever it is? And and there was so much, there's been so much in this conversation, Annalyn, I think a lot of people are going to resonate with just your openness, your ability to curate your vulnerability in a way that I think people are going to really align with because maybe there's something that people have been hiding or something that people are ashamed of that they're like, you know what, like maybe me sharing this is going to actually lead to me being happier or this, this feeling of being free or this feeling of now being enough or this feeling that I am going to achieve something. And speaking of achievement, to me, you're somebody that continues to thrive and get through hard times despite adverse situations. And I think a lot of this stems back to growing up where you had this dream to be an actress and you were told by everybody that it was never going to happen. People who are raised in, in trailer parks, I think was what you were, what you said, like they're not going to amount to anything was what people told you. Right. And you turned your back and said, watch me, I'm going to do it. And then had a successful career in, in Hollywood. And then now you face some more adverse situations, unpacking and healing from a lot of the trauma that you've endured, being open about your diagnosis with DID and, and sharing so openly with that. So what's your advice to people who feel like they have their backs against the wall, but they have this dream they want to pursue, they want to heal themselves, they want to start a business. They want to finally break out of this pattern of unhealthy relationships. They just feel like the world's against them and the odds are just not in their favor. Like, what would you tell them? What I would have told them before would be different. What I tell them now, I always would say, you know, whatever you dream, you can make happen. And I do, I do believe in that. But now I attach to that. Is this for my highest good? 
So when you're in a situation and you are back against the wall and you are trying to make this happen, ask yourself if you're pushing or if you're being persistent or if you're being, uh, if you're, yeah, if you're being persistent, if you're persevering, there's a difference between persevering and pushing. And what I've found in my life about the things that I have been able to garner success around quote unquote success, they've been things that were built on a foundation of love. I loved acting. I was talking about finding journals recently. I found a journal when I was 14 years old and I wrote a whole page. Let me tell you why I love acting so much. I love acting because it makes me feel this. When I do this amount of movies, I'm going to send all my family a plane ticket so we can have Thanksgiving at my house and no one's allowed to argue and fuss. Like I like wrote all these things in my journal at 14. But my I was gushing with love for this 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 dream. I didn't want to be famous and rich at first. <laughs> that came later. I was excited about that later. I loved what I did as an actress. I loved being an actress. I loved acting. I loved quoting lines from Shakespeare. If you love something and you infuse what you love with that love and everything that you do is centered around that love. There's a beautiful quote that I love. I think it's actually from a book called the Bible, <laughs> but it says love never fails. I didn't believe in that for a long time because the love I was taught was not a good love. It wasn't real love. It was an awful, horrible, painful, dangerous love. But as an adult going through all this healing and this, this going on this journey, I've learned what real love is. Love is complete acceptance of what is it's unconditional. Whatever is happening in this moment, all of the resistance I experienced when I was a child dreaming of being an actress, making it as an actress and feeling completely unfulfilled. <laughs> All of this, if I introduce acceptance, anything becomes possible. But what happens is that a shift might be made and you might realize that the road curves. When I became an actress, I didn't know the road was going to curve and that I would become a human rights activist which I care more about and I am more passionate. I love what I do as an actress, but I love and am so passionate about the work that I do for children, for survivors, for mental health, for all of these issues that are so dear to my heart. So if you want to actually find success in your life, it must be for your highest good. And if you start asking that, you will only find the things that in which you can infuse your love, meaning your acceptance of what is. And with that comes a life that is meaningful and purpose-driven and is actually something you can look back and say, here's my legacy and I'm so proud that I lived this life. And as I take my last breath on this planet and say goodbye to this world, I can honestly say I am exactly who I was meant to be. And I did exactly what I was meant to do. And I had some mistakes along the way. But I, as Frank Sinatra said, did it my way. <laughs> that's, that's what I hope for. And, and I believe that anyone can have that if they think first and foremost, is this, do I love this? And is it for my highest good? Amen to that. And I think, that's a really solid place for us to, to end the combo and so much great wisdom you just shared in those last few minutes. And I really invite people to, to really take in that advice that she shared on chasing your dreams and making sure that it's aligned with your highest self and making sure that at your core, like this is exactly what you want to be doing and that you're not just fulfilling you know, the identity of somebody else when you're making your decisions where you're trying to run someone else's race, you're trying to go into this profession because you think it's the cool thing to do on social media. You're not trying to go and, and do this thing in the podcast space because that's what everyone else is doing. Or you're not trying to go and, and make it in this relationship because you feel like that's what everybody tells you you should be doing. And um, there's so many great nuggets, Anna Lynn. And thank you once again for, for sharing your heart on here. I think people are going to get a lot out of it. So if people want to connect with you more, they want to listen to your podcast, they want to follow you on social media, like where's the best place to do that? Thank you so much, Doug. Thanks for having me. You can check me out on Instagram and on social at the Annalyn McCord and 
at Unzipped Pod. We have new episodes every Wednesday on pretty much every platform that you can listen to podcasts. So definitely follow those. And if you're interested about fighting human trafficking or getting more involved in that space, thelovestorm.com or at thelovestorm on all social platforms. You can check out what we're up to. We're going to start the global campaign that we initially began before COVID back in 20, uh, early 2020. We're going to start that back up next year in 2022. Incredible. Incredible. And I invite people to go check out our podcast, give her a follow on social media. And what I also invite you to do, just like I do with every episode, is to share a takeaway. Maybe it was something that Anna Lynn said when it came to her DID. Maybe it was something that she said about trauma and healing. Maybe it was something that she said about owning shame. Maybe it was something um, that she said about you know self-awareness or what it takes to chase your dreams. Whatever it was, tag Anna Lynn, tag myself, because we'd love to hear your we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopes. We'll see you next time.